Okay, uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm, I read the sort of remit as talking about what can go wrong with data sharing. And so for me, that, that's really thinking about misleading analyses, rogue analyses. Um, some disclosure about monies that you may not know about that I'm getting. Um, and advance. This is, uh, in, in 2012, uh, Aaron Kesselheim and colleagues uh, published a study that showed that industry-sponsored uh, trials are sort of systematically uh, devalued. They're trusted less uh, by physicians than non-industry-funded uh, uh, trials. That's irrespective of the methodologic quality or the trial uh, design. And so you see between, these are from the, uh, these were sent to physicians as part of the survey. The only difference between these two abstracts is the funding uh, source. And Dr. Drazen wrote an editorial accompanying uh, that article saying, asking us to believe the data. And I thought this is especially appropriate uh, for uh, today and this whole question of data sharing. That the idea should be that we shouldn't worry so much about who funded the trial uh, or who did it as much as the trial's intrinsic qualities, the study design, data accrual, and so on and so forth. But in this world that we've been living in up to the very recent or perhaps even the present, how do you assess study design? How does one do this as a third party? How do you assess quality of data or determine what is and what is not fair reporting? So I would like to believe the data, but which data should I believe? And the answer to all of these questions is that we've been working in a world where the data is really synonymous with the journal publication. And that's quite remarkable given that for every clinical trial, especially industry-sponsored trials, there's really a world of data that exists for each trial. Yet the data that we're interacting with is up at the top in the red box. It's just the journal publication. That's the world we've been in. So an example, in 2006, a Cochrane systematic review of the anti-influenza drugs did its systematic review and concluded that oseltamivir or t t Tamiflu uh, was effective in preventing lower respiratory tract infections, uh, including pneumonia, so an important uh, and serious outcome. This conclusion was driven by the literature, by journal publications. In particular, the meta-analysis was driven by the inclusion of one paper, the paper you're seeing here on the left, which it was not a single trial, but a pooled analysis of 10 tr randomized trials, all uh, conducted by the manufacturer in the late 90s. Of the 10 trials, only two were published, and only two have ever been published. Eight remain unpublished uh, to this day. The conclusion, as you would expect, is that Tamiflu reduces these lower respiratory tract complications like pneumonia, even hospitalization. Now that's interesting because if one looks at the FDA-approved uh, Roche Tamiflu product labeling, which was established, uh, this sentence that I've highlighted here uh, was put on the label in 2000, three years before this Roche paper that I just showed you, you have the exact opposite conclusion. The Tamiflu has not been shown to prevent such complications, namely serious bacterial infections. So we have a simple question. Does Tamiflu reduce risk of complications? Question that billions of dollars uh, are riding on. That's our national stockpiling, and other, other governments, of course, did this as well. But if you look at what people are saying as to what the answer is to this question, you find everything. There's lots of contradictions throughout the literature. FDA doesn't agree with EMA. Many other places, there's these disagreements. So what is the answer, and which one of those was the misleading analysis? They can't all be right, can they? So again, this I saw this as a question, this, this panel we're on as a qu time to think about how we can or what we should do about these misleading analyses or erroneous analyses or simply invalid, a more neutral term. But the point I want to make is that this is not a new problem. 
This is not like, this is something we've been dealing with for a long time. And this is a study that actually looked at randomized trials published in the literature and found that in the abstracts of published papers, 38% of results and 58% of conclusions were spun. That's the world we're living in right now, before data sharing. So at the last, it's the, no, sorry, not last, but the October 2012 uh, meeting when I spoke, I asked for examples of misleading analyses or examples where data sharing caused public health harms. And a couple of the ones that I heard were Andrew Wakefield's 1998 pa Lancet paper and hormone replacement therapy. Neither of these had anything to do with uh, sharing of clinical trial data. The worry I think that we all have is that we'll have public health harms, we'll lose an important drug over a misleading analysis, that we'll have false safety scares, that there are researchers with agendas out there and we might confuse the public with these multiple messages. I want to point out one that we're only thinking, if those are our concerns, we're only talking about misleading analyses in terms of the bad news. You can also have an invalid analysis with good news, but it's still invalid. But if the harms are our concern, I think what's really alarming is that we do not have robust methods for analyzing harms in RCTs. We're so focused on the efficacy, effectiveness, outcomes, that really what you do with the harms data varies. Often it's not pre-specified at all. So how do you do an analysis when you don't have a hypothesis? That's a place I hope the committee will uh, look at a little bit more. Avoiding storms. I don't know if this is how the committee is thinking about this, but I worry that we're trying to avoid misleading analyses when I think perhaps a better perspective is how to deal with misleading analyses because they have occurred and they will continue to occur. That's my opinion. So if you're building a ship, it's how do you weather the storm rather than try and avoid all storms. If you avoid all storms, you probably won't get to your destination. And so many of these problems like Wakefield and hormone replacement therapy may not be problems about data sharing or about the science so much as they're problems about journalism. And that's where we need to think about improving standards if we want to see us weather the storm better. And we need to look beyond the data generators and data requesters and talk about this in a more holistic perspective about knowledge production and dissemination. So this conversation, how do you get right the misleading analyses, has to be a lot broader than simply the data sharing component. Ten seconds left. Thank you.